Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. I assume you trust you're all fortified for no, I, the I uh, next two talks before lunch. Um, oh, the next speaker that. is going to be uh, Dr. Annette Govindarajan. Annette is a researcher in the biology department here at, at HUI. Uh, she focuses on understanding the biodiversity, ecology, and evolution of marine animals, uh, especially in the midwater realm. Towards these ends, she has also develops and applies environmental DNA approaches, uh, including sampling technology and strategies uh, geared toward the deep ocean. Nett has her PhD in biological oceanography from the MIT HUI joint program, and had completed her postdoc at HUI uh, also. Um, she leads the biodiversity component of the Ocean Twilight Zone program at HUI, and I'm pleased to say that she was also my graduate student and my postdoc. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, everyone can hear me okay? Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you all today about my uh, research into the biodiversity of the mesopelagic and uh, using uh, environmental DNA for that. So um, before I get started, I wanted to just actually start off by thanking the many people who have contributed to this work over the past six or so years, many of my, uh, my lab members, including uh, uh, students, postdocs, uh, research assistants, um, engineers, uh, my collaborators uh, from HUI and, and elsewhere, um, and, uh, these are, and, and all of their teams, right, and our extended uh, OTZ and uh, uh, OECI team members as well. Um, and the funding for my work has come primarily from Huey's Ocean Twilight Zone Project and the NOAA Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. So um, thinking uh, the big picture about the, the mesoplagic, and I, I think um, listening to all of the talks that came before me, I don't have to spend too much time on this point that we have this um, vast OTZ biomass, uh, but we need more information on the biodiversity uh, and the composition and the distributions of the animals that live there. And we've heard a lot about uh, the, the need for this. And uh, there's just a nice quote I have here uh, from a paper in 2016, which shortly before the start of our OTZ project. There is, however, a major lack of knowledge uh, of the global composition and distribution of mesopelagic diversity, which is understampled and sparse in data. And so, so uh, one of the key reasons that we don't have a lot of data has to do with the fact that it's difficult to access and difficult to sample. And so um, sort of reflecting on this point, and, and actually even just being, being here today, uh, at about six years into our OTZ project, it, I'm remembering the beginnings of this project. Uh, and I remember being in this very auditorium uh, watching Heidi <laughs> be live streamed with her TED talk and knowing that I had helped to contribute to that uh, and make that happen and feeling um, excited that we had, you know, launched this big initiative and that I was part of it and that was enabling uh, me to join this other larger community of, of scientists who have already been studying the mesopelagic and recognizing that work as well. And some of the ideas that gone, went into this actually extends um, um, before that to, the, to uh, work with the, the Mesobot, uh, the midwater robot, which I think um, you probably all, all know, and how to combine that with sampling and genetic analysis for biodiversity. In fact, I pulled up this old slide because conceptually we had this idea going back um, uh, you know, a very long time. This is 2015, but but we had had ideas for this. Um, it's, it's just been a long time in, in the making. So it's it's exciting to be here to, to talk about where we're at now. Uh, the work is driven by overarching science questions, such as what are you know the the, the species, the animal species. I should also mention that I'm uh, my emphasis is on animals. Um, and uh, what are these species? Animal species. How are they distributed in space and time? And the factors that are driving those distributions. Um, is very interested in dial vertical migration and uh, the um, uh, patterns and timings of those migrations and uh, in general, how can we observe and monitor changes in biodiversity in, in the OTZ. 
So my work uh, involves um, molecular approaches uh, based on DNA barcoding. And just as a, as a very short review for those of you who, who aren't doing this kind of work, whoops, whoop, not too. Well, am I going the wrong way? No, I'm not. Okay. So uh, DNA barcoding it refers to um, when we take a, 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 an animal and we um, sequence a short piece of, of DNA and, and the sequence for that DNA is similar or identical for individuals within a species, but very different for individuals from different species. Okay. And so for the past 20 plus years, we've been, scientists have been doing this for individual organisms. As the sequencing technology developed, we now we do meta barcoding where we can get sequences from bulk samples. So we can say, take a contents of a plankton toe and grind those up and get, you know, hundreds of thousands of sequences instead of a single sequence, right? And we can do that for plankton toes. We can do that for the gut contents, as we've heard. Um, and we can also now do that for, um, for environmental DNA. And so for animals, this refers to the genetic traces that that these uh, that they leave that these animals leave behind as they move through the water. So we don't actually even need to sample the animals themselves for the eDNA. We do need them for our reference libraries, but we for for the eDNA itself, we can just filter the water and and sequence uh, the water. So this is this is the process for environmental DNA uh, work. Um, whoops, gotta go to C, right? Uh, get the water. Okay. The standard way that that this is done uh, to collect the water is with Niskin bottles, usually mounted on a CTD rosette, and then you take the water on the ship and you uh, have these pumps and you uh, filter it onto little filters and you preserve those filters and take them back to the lab. I'm going to talk about autonomous technology where we can do the uh, sampling and filtering in situ, right? So we'll we'll come back to this uh, Misabot uh, sampler here. And then, um, then we take that back to the lab, and then we do a lot of um, the, the processing, the DNA extractions, the PCR, making lots of copies of, of our barcodes. Um, we sequence them, and then we compare them to our reference sequences, which come from specimens that should be ideally accurately identified, right? And, um, and then assign the, the taxonomy and analyze the, the data. So that's the process. EDNA for animals is a relatively new field. Uh, there's a nice review here that shows the increase in the literature um, with ED, EDNA papers, okay? Um, and I have here the start of the OTZ. But uh, when I look at, they had used in their paper the term marine environmental DNA, right? So that incorporates uh, a lot of, um, other work that's maybe coastal or surface water, right? And not really, um, as well as microbial right, studies, right? So it's a very broad way to look at it. And so um, when I went back through and, 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 and did my own analysis of this and added some search terms like mesopelagic and animal, right? That number shrinks way down, right? <laughs> and then when you actually start looking through the papers that do show up, they're not actual, you know, mesopelagic field studies. I actually think the first um, mesopelagic eDNA study uh, that dealt with, you know, that had eDNA with, for dial vertical migration came out of Tracy Sutton's lab, Eason et al, 2020. I think it's the first one that I've been able to find. So this is really um, a new approach. And so we took this on at the, at the, uh, at the start of the project. And, um, and so with any new method, you have to think about uh, what it is you me it means and how to interpret the data. And so we have this figure here that I have in a, in a recent review where just like any sensor, right, um, you have, you get your results, right, and represented here by the different groupings of different types of animals and their relative abundances. And then you have what really exists out in nature, out in the real world, right? And you have the real composition of, of, of what species they are and their relative abundances. Now, they don't match right here because there's biases, right? So the, the picture we get from our results, you know, it, it has some biases that cause it to differ from what's actually there in nature. And so we want to think about this, especially with something new as, as you know, I think scientists are eager to, to, to adopt eDNA, but we want to really think about what it means. And so if we can break down what are the, the factors that create this difference between the observed and, and the expected. We've got uh, various environmental factors relating to 
like, for example, how, how eDNA is shed from animals and how it's, you know, different types of animals may shed eDNA in different rates, right? And, and that can be, you know, whether it's soft stuff uh, cells or fecal pellets, gametes, parcel predation. There's a lot of different things that can go into to the shedding rates. We also want to think about how the eDNA is transported and dispersed through the ocean and then how quickly it decays. And, and there's a lot of, of um, factors that affect all of these, right? And we can act, this has actually become like a field of its own, like the ecology of eDNA, right? And there's a lot of papers, not, not necessarily on the mesopelagic, but in general that have to do with uh, these, the ecology of eDNA, okay? Then we have our sampling factors, right? And so we wanna think about things like how much, how we sample, how much volume we sample, how are we doing replicates, are we sampling at the right scales, what's our experimental design, what's our res resolution. There's actually a lot that goes into that. And then there's our laboratory factors, right? And we have our protocol choices, what we do with, with in, the in the molecular uh, steps, you know, what reagents we use, right? Uh, what, what barcodes we use. Um, and then we have our reference barcode library, right? And we know, we've heard, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but we've also heard from others that that's you know, in, in, in need of, of improvement, right? And then we have our uh, analytical methods. And so all of these steps, right, um, will, will contribute to uh, the result that we get and how that reflects or does not reflect the natural environment. So we have spent, um, in, in my lab, spent some time uh, working on many of these aspects to try to understand how, how this works for the deep sea, which uh, may be different than in um, freshwater or shallow coastal systems where eDNA is, is, has <clears throat> been more widely used. So the first um, attempt with uh, eDNA, uh, we did in a cruise in 2018 on, on, the, on the Bigelow, what was that? <laughs> um, and um, we took uh, CTD, this was in the Northwest Atlantic slope water, we took CTD, um, um, cast with Niskin bottles and collected water that way. We also had a mock nest tow to, to compare our results to, okay? And again, first time, let's see what we get. What can we learn? Uh, so we conducted uh, the, the meta barcoding, like I, I described, uh, and um, using uh, an 18S barcode marker. This is one that will amplify a wide variety of, of organisms, of, of different types of organisms. So it seemed like a reasonable uh, choice to start with on the first time, and then I also did the same for the, the mock nest uh, toe, okay, um, and compared the two, right, and so some of the just key highlights of, of the kinds of animals I found, lots of siphonophores in gray, um, krill is, is yellow, uh, copepods are purple, okay, um, and so there were some, some clear differences between what we were seeing in the eDNA and, and the mock nest. We have to remember though, these are not direct comparisons. I have apples and oranges here to remind us because a lot of times people, you know, we don't want to think of comparing eDNA to net toes as, as ground truthing. We want to think of it as what can each approach bring to the table and tell us about the mesopelagic. It's not like one is right and one is wrong. We, we know, you know, we've heard from prior talks and, and, and know from experience that the nets miss a lot of things too. But, and so does eDNA, so, but together we can, find more than we would with either one alone. So, um, you know, and if you go to an eDNA conference, like every, every eDNA scientist, it seems like has their own versions of a, of, a, of a Venn diagram where they've got their net or their trawl, right? And then their, their eDNA results and they look for um, what did they find that most methods find and what did each find on their own, right? And they all look something like this, okay? Where, where, where there's overlap and then they something unique, okay? Um, one thing that struck me was thinking about in terms of the way we were sampling, right? The a Niskin bottle, we were getting like five liters of water, right? When you think about what a, a, a mock nest is actually, you know, the volume of water that that's sampling, it's much greater, right? So I, I calculated like the number of ASVs, and uh, this is a uh, maybe a technical term here, refers to amplicon sequence variant, and so it's a unique DNA sequence. So just um, if, if you just for familiarity, okay. Um, anyway, so so we learned that eDNA is really efficient, and we're going to pick up things that we might not otherwise pick up, and uh, some of that, you know, a lot of that may be the gelatinous component. Okay. Uh, we also um, did uh, um, an NMDS plot looking uh, at, at 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 the samples from different depth categories. There were sort of clear differences, especially between the surface 
uh, zero to 100, and then the deeper layers, um, that was significant. We had samples that were taken daytime and nighttime, and um, they we did not see a significant um, effect of that that might indicate DVM, but at the same time, reflecting on what I know now, I think we weren't, um, you know, I think the way we were sampling and the level that we were looking at, which included primarily non-migrators, was probably contributing to that, but we'll come back to this data set on that topic in a little bit. Um, now, another uh, really important question when we're thinking about using eDNA in the mesopelagic is, is does our um, signal that we're getting, does it reflect where we're sampling or does it reflect somewhere else, you know, upstream or in the surface, especially in the mesopelagic where we've got, um, you know, migrating animals, how can, you know, can we, um, how do we know it's not all just all mixed up, right? And so, um, so my postdoc, Eileen Allen with uh, Gordon Zhang, who co-advised her with, with me and she did a modeling study um, to specifically to look at, at this factor in the vertical direction, dimension, right? And so the bottom line of what she found was that uh, the eDNA signal stays fairly close, like in 20, you know, tens of meters, 20 meters or so, um, in the vertical dimension, right, from where it was shed. And so what that tells us is that uh, we can um, um, use eDNA to, to be informative about vertical patterns and processes, which we are especially interested in, okay? And so, um, so these are like, imagine a hypothetical species going between 50 and 500, that the, clearly the, the, the signal is uh, relative concentrations are, are where they spend most of their daytime and nighttime hours, and then th these represent the, the, the transit times, but we are seeing um, <clears throat> the this, this signal being reflected. Um, another, you know, again, thinking back to our first experience, another lesson was thinking about the volume that we were sampling. So one, it was, we were getting, you know, it, it's very efficient, but at the same time, are we, are we sampling enough? Because I had noticed that the eDNA concentrations were, were very low once you got uh, below the surface. Okay, and so the, the typical way in which, again, that we do that, get that, that people get eDNA samples at sea is with these Niskan bottles. This is a close up of, of our pump system from one of our cruises. So, you know, one thing, a couple things might strike you is um, the complexity of it all. <laughs> um, we call this the spaghetti slide because of all the tubing, and we don't want to, we have to be really careful not to mix anything up, and we also want to be careful. You know, contamination is, is always a concern when you're working with eDNA because it's such a sensitive technique. Um, and also, you know, when you use a, a CTD rosette, you know, you're limited in your, your experimental designs, right? So, so, you know, we wanted to, to improve upon this um, um, model here. So, and so we did that by developing autonomous samplers that can do the filtration in situ, right? So we saved a lot of labor because filtering all those bottles takes a lot of time on the ship <laughs> and, you know, and it reduces uh, the pathways for contamination and, and um, mistakes to happen, right? So it has a lot of advantages in addition to allowing uh, additional um, experimental designs. So uh, we did our first um, comparison with version one of our multi-sampler shown here. Um, put on the um, uh, midwater robot Mizabot, right? And this was on a cruise in the Gulf of Mexico um, on the Manta with, um, with collaborators Dana Yerger, uh, Santiago Herrera, and Jill McDermott. And uh, we did a comparison with the Niskan bottles to see what we would find. So we had the large volume sampling on, on the, the multi-sampler and then small volume sampling with the CTD. And so the hypotheses that we had tested were we will detect more taxa with the large volume Mizabot sampler, and also that the small volume CTD taxa would be a subset of those from the large volume, and that we would also um, expect that perhaps the, the, the patterns uh, are being driven by the most common um, um, community members, so that, 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 that the small volume might be sufficient to um, um, see overall trends in community structure. Okay, so uh, here's where we sampled um, two sites in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the slope is the deeper site. What we call slope site is the deeper water site. Um, and what we've shown uh, here is that indeed, as as 
um, we had noticed in our prior Bigelow data is that the eDNA concentration really declines greatly with depth, right? And so that I think that, that it's, it's kind of ironic because we've been hearing all along all this immense biomass of the mesopelagic, but the, you know, but the eDNA signal gets really dilute. Um, so anyway, um, it's very um, consistent. We see this pattern with every cruise, okay? Um, and what we see uh, was, in fact, that we detect greater number of taxa as um, here, the, the prox proxy for taxa is, is A of Cs. If you remember that term, that's the amplicon sequence variant or the, the unique sequences. And so the triangles, which represent the mesobot, um, yielded more uh, uh, unique sequences than, um, than the, the niskins, okay? And then we also, um, our other next hypothesis that the uh, um, <clears throat> small volume CTD samples would be a subset of the mesobot samples was also supported when we compared specific taxa at each site. And our um, uh, final hypothesis that the, the depth related patterns and community structure were evident with both types of sampling. Okay, and so that's suggesting that, that maybe that's being driven by the more common um, Taxa, right? But if you're interested in um, maximizing your biodiversity detection or interested in, in rare um, taxa, that you might want larger volumes, okay? Um, we've since um, uh, gone beyond the initial version one sampler. We now have, have a newer version and we've put it on um, multiple platforms so that we can, um, you know, it was Mesobot, um, again, was our first. Uh, trial with, with, the, with the R multi-sampler, um, but we have now since put uh, samplers on, on Toad Instruments, uh, Andoni Lavery's Deep Sea, a broadband acoustics and imaging. Um, I've got it on an on ROV with uh, Santiago Herrera, right? And so the goal here is, um, um, and our vision is really to get, um, integrate autonomous sampling onto all um, ocean exploration platforms. And so that it becomes a routine type of um, data collection, just like we collect all other types of data and that it's just everywhere, right? And so we, the advantages are that we can utilize diverse uh, platform capabilities for other types of sense data, right? For, for the environmental context and to um, <clears throat> provide that, that framework for, for hypothesis testing. Um, and that we're also tailoring our approach to deep sea needs, which include large volumes. And another um, um, thing is adaptive sampling because get remind, remember thinking about again how big the environment is and and how the biomass is not distributed evenly through that 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 big uh, area. It's it's um, you know we see layers right, and so we may want to maximize our sampling efforts and focus on the interesting parts or you know and and um, if we can do that maybe with adaptive, especially in conjunction with acoustics, right? And then finally, we want to really radically scale, scale up the, the sampling. And so we've talked about this need for, for more data, more samples, um, global view, um, all, all of that. And, and so we really need to do that. But the, the way to do that, right, is to not only um, outfit all of our platforms with samplers, but, but to go beyond that and, and, and um, become independent of, of ships, right? Uh, not that we always need ships. But we'll also um, involve autonomy and autonomous surface vehicles and 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 moorings, so that we can, um, you know, we it's a big place. We need to 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 just be creative and 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 utilize um, these other approaches. And so that's something that that I'm um, interested in as we move forward and our next steps. Um, here are some examples uh, of sampling and ways of thinking about the data and interpreting the data once you collect it from different platforms because there's some they're not all necessarily measuring the same thing right if you get edna samples they um um are taken in different ways so for example um you know mesobot which has the ability to um, um move in a lagrangian way so with a parcel of water right and it also has the samplers have a high flow rate so we can get large volumes like that represent the same parcel um, we've got CTDs, which are basically instantaneous snapshots, and then other types of um, sampling methods might be code um, or, or over uh, integrative over over time and space. And so we need to think about like when we're comparing different eDNA samples, right? What 
what they're actually measuring. And I have this nice um, image that Hui Graphics made for me that, that illustrates the different types of whether it's Lagrangian or instantaneous integrative. And then Eulerian, say, if we have samplers on a mooring and the water is moving past it, right? So these are things that, that should be considered as we expand our eDNA sampling platforms. Um, and here's some examples of the adaptive sampling approaches that we've been doing. Um, this is, uh, we've had the multi-sampler on uh, deep sea. This is, you know, again, this Andoni Lavery's instrument uh, as it's on a cruise last summer. And what we were able to do is control the sampling from the ship and say, okay, we see something, you know, we're in an interesting layer um, from the echo sounder or from, from the deep sea data and push the button and say, we want to sample right here, right? And we can sample above and within and below layers that way. Okay, and um, similarly, that was done um, um, on the um, ROV Sebastian with, with, with my, my colleague Santiago. And then uh, another different approach to adaptive sampling uh, we're doing through the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute, being led by Larry Mayer, um, as well as Val, Val Schmidt and, and Dana Yerger, where we've got the sampler on Mizabot and uh, we're getting the acoustic information um, with, 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 with the autonomous surface vehicle DRIX. And that's directing, and then we direct uh, Mies about where to, where to go based on that. So that's a different approach. So 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 that um, uh, so again, we've done a lot of work on on, on that component. Another um, piece of the the eDNA um, framework that we've been working on is um, the reference library. Particularly, the focus has been on fish, um, and um, we've been getting you know I've been lucky to get. Um, hundreds of specimens of fish from my collaborator, Joel Yopes, uh, from his um, numerous cruises over the years. And we've um, identified them using what we call integrative taxonomy, where we use multiple lines of approaches, uh, morphology in combination with the DNA barcoding to get um, an accurate ID on that. I think getting accurate IDs is very important and we can't, um, we need to appreciate that th this is a, is a scientific discipline and that species names are our scientific hypotheses that can be tested in this way and appreciate this work because, um, you know, I, I think we learned some of that also from Dougal's talk that this is really important um, because everything depends on your identifications being correct, right? So it's it's um, <clears throat> it's it's a it's a discipline in and of itself. It's more than just a, um, a, a it's, this is more than just bookkeeping. Okay, this is a, a discipline in and of itself. And so what we have uh, in a paper in review um, is we generated a reference library for 80 different species of mesopelagic fishes. Uh, we identified them using uh, morphological keys. Um, and, and we also have a photographic record where they're all georeferenced as well. And that will be on, online and linked to the DNA sequences, okay? As is another uh, from the same specimens, uh, many of the same specimens. We also have an otolith library uh, that was just published and is, should, should be available online now um, by uh, uh, Lou Quigley, um, who was a Joel student. And so this is linked to our, our specimen identification. We sequence the CO1 as well as the 12S, right? The CO1 database is, is pretty well established for years of, of, of effort in that area, but the eDNA community has shifted to 12S for fish. Right, so um, oh, I'm really behind here. So anyway, so that's um, um, that's in, in prep. So we applied this to a um, eDNA data set going back to our uh, Bigelow 2018 cruise. Okay, um, and and which with the V9 we didn't find the fish because it was the wrong mar marker. We learned, but here we learned that in fact there were fish, <laughs> including Cyclothony. I got to say that's for Tracy. <laughs> and um, we found a lot more species uh, in the shallowest uh, depth zone at night than in the day, um, it, as we would for DVM. And then um, I just wanted to end with some future directions that we want to use this work. Uh, I think you've seen Paola Badalona and my postdoc Nina Yang has been working on um, the, the salps. We want to put the, the eDNA with the gut content work to look at selectivity and learn where the salps are feeding and their behavior. Um, we're also um, looking at uh, using Mizabot to look at time series of DVM in conjunction with the acoustics, um, taking advantage of its um, that fact that we're sampling throughout the, the water parcel there and, and test hypotheses related 
to the community before, during, and after migration. And then um, the lastly, I've got here this slide where we're looking at sampling from our uh, another Bigelow cruise at two sites, uh, one under with different um, water characteristics, one um, with influenced by a warm core ring, and, and the other outside of that, right? And we're so we're seeing different. Uh, communities, and we're looking at how depth distributions and, and migration patterns change uh, as a result of that, um, the, the water column structure. So anyway, I sort of rushed through these last pieces because um, I see from KR that I was out of time. So I'll just end here, and hopefully I'll have left some time for questions. Um, anyway, thank you. So I, I guess I don't have time for questions. Sorry about that for going too long. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we'll we'll hold questions for the panel, which won't be too long from now. And uh, thanks again to you, Annette.